So Fourth of July just passed, and uh, most of us were some of us weren't here, but most of us um, we had a barbecue pool party um, at my house, and uh, one of the surprises of the night was actually um, I don't know if you guys remember, but um, somebody can't say who because possible uh, legal ramifications in the Los Angeles County. We found out that fireworks are illegal, um, but uh, there was one of the surprises was seeing some amazing fireworks that night, right? Um, and um, some were so close that my mom was quite startled, and um, you know I was kind of scared that something might happen too, because the fireworks that were they weren't little, pssss, they were like, poof, you know, like, you know, it's pretty. It was it was the most intense fireworks that I've seen in like on a like a street level. I don't know. Maybe you guys have seen more, but I mean, like outside, like you know, like where you can light it at home, and. Um, well, nothing bad happened at my house. Um, that's why we're all here, and no one's like, no one's like burned with scar tissue or anything. Nothing bad happened, but there were a lot of a lot of other disasters in the news, like uh, we, I just showed you that clip. Um, that was from Simi Valley, actually, which is only about you know 30 minutes north of here. Luckily, the latest reports say that there were no casualties in the disaster at Simi Valley. Um, but being that this week's passage was uh, about angels, um, you know, all week I was kind of sensitive to like disasters. I was kind of sensitive to like I was thinking about angels, angels. I was like, what clip do I want to show? Do I want to show like uh, Jordan, uh, Gordon Levitt, whatever, Joseph Gordon Levitt doing this? You know, angels in the back. You guys know that movie, Angels in the Outfield. Like that was the guy from Inception, you know. And like, uh, but anyway, I was like, show, do I want to show, you know, a clip from there? And and luckily we found um, that clip. I found that clip, but um. Yeah, so this week's message is about angels, and I was very sensitive to disasters. And because my house didn't burn down, um, I was very thankful for God's grace. Um, uh, you know, what's interesting, though, is that yesterday I found a leak in our water boiler. Okay? Like, right now we have a leak at home. Like, while we're here, it's leaking little bits. Little bits. And, um, and we have no hot water at home uh, because we have to get that thing replaced. I think it's... Older than I am. I, I don't know that water boiler. I think it's older than. It's probably it hasn't been replaced since. It probably wasn't replaced when we moved there, and that was like so many. Yeah, we got our money's worth. Now it's time to get a new one. But, um, and we found uh, that uh, we found the leak just in time. And once we diagnosed the problem, we were able to contain it. You know, um, it wasn't that big of a deal. But and actually, in fact, our neighbor, um, he uh, even told us that he would be able to, you know, replace it tomorrow. So we're gonna, you know, it, it's gonna be taken care of. My mom uh, actually has a nickname for this neighbor. She calls him her guardian angel. Coincidence? I don't know. But he literally has been like a guardian angel. Like every um, disaster that has happened at home or potential disaster, it's like he was the guy who happened to have like, oh, wait, you know, like you need a washer? I happen to have one in my pocket. Like, and he would just fix it. Like he was just always like there at the right time. Other times, you know, like I remember one time for like Christmas, mom was like, oh, go send them this like cake that, you know, we got dessert. And I would go and I'd knock. They're not home. You know, I'd go and like ding dong and nobody's there. And I, I would just have to like leave it on the mailbox, send him a message and then leave. Like whenever, you know, like in those situations, it's like he's not there. But whenever there's a disaster, he shows up like he's like and saves the day. And so my mom's nickname is for him is Guardian Angel. You know, um, angels uh, by nature are, according to the Bible, spiritual beings. But sometimes uh, I believe that they manifest themselves physically. Uh, whether you call it coincidence, I don't believe in coincidences. So I actually believe that, you know, God has angels that he commands armies of to do his will. And actually, that's why today we're going to look actually into the Bible. Let's look at what the Bible says about angels. Well, I mean, we're, this month we're starting Hebrews. So uh, this, you know, let's read it together, actually. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? They are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. You and I are those who will inherit salvation. We have inherited salvation. Those in the field that we want to share, we share the gospel with, are those who will inherit salvation. You know, in the Old Testament times, um, there's examples where, uh, like, 
in Genesis. There's a time when Abraham, the important words were relayed to Abraham by the angels that came. He had three visitors coming, and you know they came to him, and he realized, wait, these these people are kind of weird. Like they're not regular human beings. Um, there's a, a TV series called The Bible. Um, it's a mini series that came out. It was actually created by uh, this this producer who produces like uh, Apprentice and like uh, uh, like all the all those like uh, those reality TV shows, right? He created a TV show called uh, The Bible. And I saw it. It was, it was really interesting. I really liked it. And there was a scene where Abraham is, is cloaked like a, like a herd, herdsman, you know, like, like a, he's got like this kind of like um, cloak type of thing, right? And he's just like in normal like robe, like what you would think of stereotypical Israelite clothing, right? But then these three guys come, and these three guys come, like, uh, and he sees them. And he, the reason why I'm sharing this is because, like, you know, they visualize that. And, you know, Abraham saw these three people coming and was like, whoa, those people are kind of weird. You know how they portrayed it? In the TV show, they come, they're cloaked like this, right? But when, they, when Abraham notices that they're kind of weird, he's like, you know, lords, where are you? You know, like, who are you? Where are you from? They unveil themselves, and they're in armor, like Roman armor. So in our view, Roman armor is like, old stuff but imagine from Abraham's view these they're like in they're like you know robot technotra like kind of like armor like full-on armor and it, it, it contrasts you know like what they were what Abraham was wearing that day that's how they showed it but that was what I was thinking when uh, I you know the words that Abraham got from these angels how did he know that they were angels how did he know to call them Lord because he knew somehow maybe the, maybe it wasn't the armor you know maybe that, that's the way the TV show portrayed it maybe it was a a light, I don't know, but God revealed himself through the angels and gave him important words to Abraham. If you look in Exodus, the angels helped Moses um, when they crossed from Egypt into the wilderness. And th the angels were there um, ahead and behind, it says, working, preparing the way for Moses and the Israelites to go. You know, King David was another example. He writes about in the book of Psalms 103, verse 20 to 22, 22, that the heavenly hosts are at work where God's words are fulfilled. He writes a lot of psalms, and in that poetry, he describes the angels. He saw angels. If we look in 2 Kings, um, Elisha, a prophet, right? He was the one who, um, if you don't if you remember, he, he was the prophet, the second prophet after Elijah. Elijah was this, like, old gangster prophet, right? Like, the guy was so old, and he was so great that God was like, you know what? I'm not going to let you die. I'm going to send you a chariot on fire, take you to heaven. And Elisha saw this. He's like, he was like, no, let me follow you, master. He's like, I want to be your apprentice. And then one day he's like, you know, one day will I ever be ready? And he's like, well, pray, ask God. And he's like, I want to ask God to be, you know, double blessing of, Elisha, of what you have, Elijah. And Elisha experiences something that not a lot of people get to see. He sees a chariot from heaven come down, picking up Elijah and taking him off. He's like, one minute, he was there. Next minute, he's alone. He's like, huh. This Elisha, later in, in, um, the, in the Chronicle of the Kings, goes and he's facing the king of Syria and his servant. Now this time, now he has a servant, right? He was Elijah's like apprentice. Elisha has a servant now apprentice and his apprentice is like he calls him master is like how are we going to fight the syrian army they're like hundreds of thousands whereas we're so small and outnumbered and he tells him you know hey don't worry about it later on he's like oh please i i what we're, we're gonna die don't we have to run away he's like god opened his eyes and he saw angels and chariots in the sky camped around the syrian army and he said that those who are with us are more than those who are with them. They were invisible to his servant. But when God revealed it, when God revealed his glory, Elisha was able to testify of that. Other people in the Bible, in the Old Testament, King Hezekiah. Um, King Hezekiah, he was a person who prayed. Uh, see, he, he kind of had this kind of like love-hate relationship with God. Like whenever he needed God, he would be like, God, I need you. And then when he was cool, he'd be like, God, God, what? Like, you know, like, you know, with those people that, um, you know, you're, you're, when you're in the wilderness, you're like thankful 
that your Verizon phone gets reception. You know, like, haha, everyone's like zero bars, but you got a bar. And you're like, yeah, I got. And then when Verizon calls you, like, hey, you got to pay your bill. You're like, oh, can I go? You know, <laughs> decline. You know, like, that's the kind of relationship that Hezekiah had with God. And what happened was, he was being threatened by the Assyrian king, the Assyrian army. And he was being threatened by the Assyrian army, 185,000 strong at his doorstep. Basically saying, knock, knock, we're here to take your land. You know, like, and it was pretty much like, you have no power. He prayed desperately before God, and God sent one angel. And that one angel, in one night, destroyed all 185,000 of them. Other people in the Bible, um, there's references. You guys remember uh, Daniel? He had, uh, not that, our Daniel Lee. Uh, Daniel, the Hebrew Daniel, had three friends. You know, it was Daniel and his three friends. I don't know why we, you know, we always, like in the Bible too, like, or in Sunday school, we always learn about the three friends as the three friends. It's not like you learn them as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. It's like you got you to gotta go, go to high school before you learn that, right? When you're in like junior high, elementary, you know? Like today in the morning, when in the kids' message, I was like, "Hey, do you guys know Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego?" And they were like, "Or I, I had it on the board." And they were like, "Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego." You know, like I couldn't pronounce it because it's kind of hard to pronounce. And I was like, "Okay, I kind of see why. Maybe we don't tell her, make it easier." Daniel's really easy to pronounce, <laughs> but the other names are kind of hard. But those three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, um, in Daniel chapter three, verse eight to twenty-four, there's a story of Daniel and his three friends. Uh, that they're living now in the kingdom of Babylon, right? Those three friends, they refuse to worship and bow down to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar sets up. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, is so angry. So he's like, you're not going to bow down? Okay, let's light them on fire. It's the 4th of July in Babylon, okay? They're like, they lit up the, they lit up the furnace to get it hot. And it was really hot. They're like, okay, uh, king, it's kind of hot. Like, no, I want it hotter you know like i wanted bigger and so his soldiers go and light up even more they make it hotter so hot that they end up dying themselves and he's like okay okay all right i lost i lost some soldiers it's hot enough send them in you know like then, then he push in shadrach meshach abednego in the bible it says that when they were thrown in there was three of them they were bound like this you know but nebuchadnezzar's like you know he's eyeing it. he's like yeah i want to see those suckers burn you know like and he's like watching them and he's like wait there were three, but why are there four? Why do I see four? And they're walking around like they're in a picnic. And then he's like, wait, what? Okay, turn the fire up. Bring them out. And he's like, what happened? And his friends are like, the angel of the Lord came and protected us from the flames. And he was like, bow down. You know, like he was like, okay, now what am I, what, what is Nebuchadnezzar going to say to that? That was how the three friends of Daniel experienced an angel working in his life. Because they stood up for their heart to not worship anyone else but the one true God. Daniel himself, in Daniel chapter 6, later on, gets caught up in some scandal. Gets caught up in some... Actually, that song, Scandal, I thought he was joking. I was like, scandal, oh, scandalous. But it's a real song. Okay. <laughs> but Daniel gets caught up in a scandal. Daniel sang scandal. Great. Anyway, Daniel in the Bible gets caught up in a scandal. He ends up getting sentenced. And his sentence is to be thrown into a den of ravagingly hungry lions. You know, um, lions, I, I took the most, because uh, in the morning it's the kids, I, I show them slides. And I tried to find a picture of the uh, of a lion, lion's den. I couldn't find it, right? So I found a picture of a lion. Amongst the lion pictures, I was like, you know, I, I don't want to be too violent or too graphic. So I found the most calm and, and peaceful, like royal looking lion, right? And I showed it to them. And, and I said, hey, does, what does he look like? And they're like, oh, he's scary. He looks hungry. I was like, you know, like, wow, I guess lions, you know, like that normal lion, they were like, looked hungry. If these lions, and th I'm telling you, this, this lion picture was, he was like, you know, like king, like this, noble, not, you know. But if they were hungry, if they were like, say, fasted for weeks, waiting for this big scandalous event for their meal ticket, you know, Daniel to drop down from, from the lion's view of heaven, right? They must have been so hungry. But in the Bible, it says that when he was dropped down and when his king came in the next morning and said, hey, are you okay? 
Did God protect you? Did God protect you? Daniel says the angel of the Lord came and closed their mouth. It's like, can you imagine that lion, you know, so hungry. It's like in its eyes, it's like beating, like it's like staring at you. And then, and then it goes to bite you and it's like, <laughs> it's like all it could do is keep kissing Daniel, right? Like, because his mouth is shut. It's like, <laughs> and, it's like, and Daniel's like, okay, all right. You know, like they got these crazy eyes, but then they're just kissing in him. And the angel of the Lord sealed off their mouths. You know, Actually, the bad guys that uh, put Daniel in that scandalous situation, later on, the king gets really angry, gets revenge, and he says, okay, throw them in. And it says in the Bible that they get thrown in, and they get eaten up before they even hit the ground. Did you guys see World War Z? You see that wall picture where they were... <laughs> yeah, like, dude, those lions were going up on those like scandalous people, like, <laughs> eating them up before they even hit the ground. That's how hungry they were. But the power of God's angel was to seal their mouth shut. In the New Testament, there's examples of angels. When Christ, um, after he cruci was crucified, he rose again. He stayed with his disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven, right? When he ascended into heaven, you, can you imagine? Okay, so you, you've been hanging out with this guy. He says he's going to die. He's going to come back to life. And you're like, okay, I'd like to see this, right? And then he does. And you're like, wait, wait, this guy, is he, is he for real? And he's kicking it with you for like 40 days. You're not, you're not, you don't know it's going to be 40 days. You're, you're like, wow, Jesus is like alive. He's like with me. He's like hanging out with us. He's eating with us. He's with us. And he, this guy was just crucified last week. He's with us. One day, he's up on a mountain and he's like, boom, I got to go. I'll be back. And he ascends into heaven. If, you, if I was one of his disciples, I'd be, like, I'd, be, I'd be like, wait, what just happened? Like, I'm looking up to heaven like, are you seriously going to leave now? Like, were you were, I mean, we all know that what he said was true. But I mean, at that time, they were like, probably wondering, wait, did you really mean you were going to die? And then he died. Like, wait, did you? No, nah, he, didn't, he didn't mean he was going to come back to life. Oh, he came back to life. What? And then. He's like, oh, well, he came back to life, and then you're, you're going to, what, do something else, right? And, and no, you're going to hang out with us for 40 days? Like, and then one day you're like, one day, then it's all of a sudden, he's like, I got to go. I'll be back. And you're like, are you, and they're thinking, are you really going to come back? And they're like seeing him going up, ascending into heaven. You know what happens is that as soon, I mean, the disciples, they're, they're, they're you know, they're not like, okay, bye, Jesus. Be, while you're gone, I'm going to do what you said. I remember. Make, go make disciples. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. I got you. No, they're like sitting there like, did this just happen? Like, this guy keeps saying stuff that I can't believe. This guy keeps saying stuff that's impossible. And things are taking place. So the Bible records them that they're just sitting there. They don't go out and make disciples. They're just standing there. The angels come down. The angels have to come down and be like, yo, um, why are you guys looking just like he went up, he's going to come back down. Now go. You know, like Jesus told them to go, and they're like sitting around like the angels have to come and remind them, now go. Don't worry. The angels come, reveal themselves to the disciples at the ascension. Another um, example in Matthew uh, chapter 4, 11, there's a period in Jesus' life when before he does his ministry, he, you know, he goes to the wilderness, and Satan comes to tempt him. You guys know about this, right? He spends 40 days in the wilderness. Love that number 40. You know, I don't know. It's, it's kind of mystical. but Maybe when we all, maybe when I hit 40, some miracle will happen. Like I'll grow like four inches or something. Like but 40 days he spends in the wilderness. He's being tempted. Satan is like saying to him like, hey, you see all this? Uh, you know, you worship me. I'll give you this kingdom. You'll be quite popular. Because, you know, he wasn't that popular. Uh, amongst the officials. Even in his own town, he wasn't very popular. And he's like, no, no thanks. Jesus resists the temptation. He even says, hey, aren't you hungry? You know, after 40 days, you know, like the lions must have been hungry. He was probably hungry too. He's like, why don't you make this bread, uh, make this rock into bread? And Jesus is like, no, I'm not going to do it. He resists the temptation. Once Satan gives up, though, What's funny, what's interesting is, as soon as Satan gives up and like let go, the, it says in the Bible, the angels come and serve him. 
He must have been hungry. He's like, he was like, he had the buffet on call, right? 40 days, eh, 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 the angels are coming down, bringing seafood, whatever. It's a desert. Probably don't have seafood. <laughs> He's not the seafood I'm thinking. But the angels appear, you know? They come. They attend to him, it says. And, you know, they're active in G when Jesus is actually doing his ministry. Later on, um, the church faces a lot of persecution. In that persecution, uh, the church is basically in a state of great crisis. What has happened is that uh, Peter, one of the leaders, was caught in prison, and he was supposed to be executed. So all the, ga the church gathered in uh, their you know, homes, and they were praying. And as they prayed amidst that great crisis in Acts chapter 12, the angel of the Lord comes and sets Peter free. It's like, it's like they're praying, dear God, please set Peter free. Set Peter free. Dear God, please. Duke, duke, duke. I'm without the door. Go get it. Okay. They go, hello? It's like, hey, it's me, Peter. Yeah, right, whatever. Dear God, please set him free. Set him free. And then they're like, the little girl who actually went to the door and said to everybody, like, hey, it's Peter. And they're like, yeah, yeah, Peter's, Peter's soul is probably, you know, with us you know, in spirit. And like, no, he's at the door. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? They couldn't believe. But the angel had set him free. The angel had set him free and he walked out and he came home. The angel of the Lord was intercessing for the prayers of the believers at that time. When there was great crisis, the angel opened up the gates, let Peter come back because it wasn't time for Peter to die. It wasn't time for him to be, to suffer death yet he still had a lot of things to do you know even the apostle paul you know the apostle paul he was uh finally caught and gonna go to rome and he got on this ship and there was this huge storm right remember that and the huge huge storm everyone's like okay you know what we should just uh wait out the winter and some people were like well maybe should, maybe we can make it maybe we won't maybe. they debated and they decided okay you know what let's go for it let's go for it and they're going and the Apostle Paul, you know, and everybody, they're all afraid facing this storm. But the angel of the Lord says to Paul, he's like, don't worry. Don't worry. You know why? See, they thought that if the prisoners get shipwrecked or the boat gets sunk or whatever, if these prisoners, the Roman prisoners, if they are somehow freed or released or run away, that responsibility goes on to those soldiers. So they're like, Facing the storm, okay, we're, we might, we're going to die, so let's just kill everybody, including Paul. Let's kill everybody. At least then, if we survive, we don't have to worry. And the angel told Paul, no, stop. You guys aren't going to die. Nobody's going to die. You're going to be good. And what ends up happening is Paul says, and Paul has some, like, he's, he must be pretty good with his words because he convinces them not to kill everybody. The ship wrecks, and they land on an island, and none of them die. In fact, some miracles take place there. But the angel of the Lord was with Paul on his journey, even when he was afraid. It's like I see, like, you know, in, in the Bible, when, when we're alone, when Jesus ascended and left us alone, you know, when we felt alone, when uh, we are tempted, when there's crisis, when we're fearful, when we're afraid. And finally, even when we're exiled, even when we're act like, the disciple that Jesus loved, his name was John. They, they call him the disciple that Jesus loved. He was the one that near the end, when everyone else had been killed, he was like one of the last people standing. He wrote the book of Revelations. And he gets exiled onto the island of Patmos. And when he's there, he sees angels. He, and he writes the Revelation. He records in Revelations um, chapter 8. He records about how the angels go and send their prayers that we pray up to God on golden um, on golden censers up before God. He said, it's like he was seeing, like people are like, oh man, he must have been doing LSD or he must, he must have been high on something. Uh, but he was, he was seeing something. He was seeing something and he recorded it down. You know, some of his visions were so psychedelic that scholars and theologians don't want to touch it. They don't want to pretend like they know. It's kind of like, this is what John wrote. Let's leave it at that. You know, and when, and, when, and when Jesus comes, we can look back and be like, whew, he was right. Or, you know, don't be like saying stuff that Jesus is going to come and literally, you know, like the disciples. They're like, 
what, Jesus, you're going to die? He dies. You're going to come back to life? Comes back to life. If you try to decipher revelations, be like, well, it says scepters, or it says, it says churches, it says, you know, seven-headed beast, but it doesn't really mean that. What if it really takes place? You guys, there's a movie that, was, that I saw recently called This is the End. And one of the characters, have you guys seen this? Let me spoil it for you again. I love spoiling movies at church. But at the, in the movie, you know, one of the guys is like, maybe this is the apocalypse. And he's like, what? Apocalypse with, like, with Satan and a horned demon beast. And boom, the horned demon beast comes. And he's like, so as far as John's psychedelic visions, let's not pretend. Let's not try to, let's don't touch that. You know, what every, everything he wrote about like these golden scepters literally going up into heaven, they might actually be taking place. You know, a lot of people will try to like scientifically rationalize it. You know? Some things you just got to leave. Wait for the mystery. Because when Jesus comes, I'm going to be like, oh wait, let me, let me turn. Oh, we're in chapter 3, guys. And then, <laughs> we're in chapter 8. You know what's going to happen next? I got the... It'll be great. If, we're, if I'm still here. When we are in exile, when we're afraid, when we're in crisis, when we're in temptation, when we are alone, these are the times in the New Testament that the angels were working. In the book of Hebrews, the writer confesses this, chapter uh, 1, verse 14. All angels are ministering servants sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Later on in Hebrews chapter 12, 22, he says, Angels are powerful like an innumerable army. Uncountable. An army so vast. And remember when, you know, uh, King Hezekiah prayed? King Hezekiah was a wishy-washy prayer, remember? You know, if you guys, you know, are worried, like, man, you know, oh, I wish I, my prayer life is not as good, you know, like, I've been kind of down spiritually. Dude, you're better than King Hezekiah. And you know what happened to King Hezekiah? He had an angel, one angel, who wiped out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. That power is the power that we have, that God has. He's on our side. Now, when I uh, say the writer of Hebrews, the reason why um, it's the writer of, you know, like, I, you know, I always thought that, you know, like, the New Testament was written all by Paul. Like, you know, like that's, because most of it is written by Paul. And, you know, we accredit Paul to a lot of, you know, of the books. The writer of Hebrews, it's actually unknown. Here's some interesting things I want to share about that. Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Apollos, Luke, Philip, Priscilla, Aquila, Clement of Rome, they could have all written Hebrews. People, different scholars have different theories. It doesn't say. You know, and we read in Philemon, right? When Philemon was, when, when we, Paul was writing to Philemon about Onesimus, he made it very clear, right? This is Paul. You owe me. So take care of Onesimus or I'm going to get you, right? Like he wrote with my own hand. Hebrew doesn't, ha the book of Hebrews doesn't have that clear of a right uh, signature. What's another thing is in, but in verse, uh, in chapter two, verse three, the writer states that he has, Received confirmation of Christ from others. You know, like he was evangelized. So some people think that, um, and because he says that he received a confirmation from others, it's kind of different from Paul, because Paul was somebody who said that he had received confirmation directly from God and not from men in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. So people are th that's why people are thinking, well, it's probably not Paul. It could be Paul, but it's probably not Paul because Paul made it very clear, like, I'm an outlier. You know? Like, literally, I was walking down the street, and a big light came, and went, boom, and blinded me and said, hey, stop chasing my peoples, you know? Like, you're a bad person. Paul was like, okay, dear God, Lord, sorry, my bad. Paul said very clearly that he... You know, God confirmed directly from God, not from men. Because it is quite puzzling, it is best to accept the anonymity of the writer of Hebrews. But here's the fascinating thing for me. Because we don't know who wrote it, you know, um, because it was, you know, in a way we can't know for sure. I know ultimately it was God who wrote it, right? The Holy Spirit. It was ultimately the Holy Spirit who inspired someone to write it. But even if it wasn't Paul, 
Remember last week's message about true disciples? Those people, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, they were true disciples. So it was like, you know, it's to the point where there's, you know, the writing seems like it could have been written by Paul. You know, those, aside from those little certain facts that I shared with you. But Paul's true disciples, I think, wrote whoever it was. It was his true disciples. They wrote it. In the, in the book of Hebrews, or the book of Hebrews, let me give you a little bit more context. There is an emphasis in the, uh, in the book about uh, the Levitical priesthood. So Hebrews, you know, is like the other word for, you know, Jews or uh, Israelites. And people think that this book uh, that is written mostly for the Hebrew audience. We would be like Gentile, right? And so there's a lot of references in the book that are significantly or specifically for Hebrew Levite like peoples, people who knew that. And actually, there's no reference to anything of the Gentile community. So it wasn't written for the Gentiles. But the reason why they wrote it, this letter, why was there a letter written to the Hebrews? Because they were actually the first converts, you know. Jesus was a Jew. It's like people like, you know, the people like who are like, you know, hating, hate anti-Semitic people or like they hate other religions and like, you know, I'm a Christian. They hate all like other, you know, Jews or Muslims. I was like, yo, you know, you're all related, right? Like, you know, we're all come from Father Abraham. Like, it's all, we're like cousins of each other. It's like, there's no need to hate. Jesus was a Jew, you know, like, it's like, but here, the background is a lot of these Jews, they had first accepted Jesus. They came into the church. They came into the community, but they started facing tremendous persecution. So at first it's like, Wow, hallelujah, good news, glad tidings. Jesus is a Messiah, he's here, and then they're like all happy, right? And then what happens? It's like, um, I saw a trailer of a movie. Uh, uh, it was about, you know how most love stories are like, they all get married and then happily ever after, and then it's the end, like roll credits, right? This movie was about what happens after that. You know, like the movie takes place in the beginning. It starts with dun, 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 and it's two hours of madness because, you know, marriage is hard. Supposedly, I don't know. Dan, Christina. <laughs> These Jews, they met Jesus. They realized the gospel. They were very glad. But then persecution came. You know, and I wish I, I wish that we could say that they everybody overcame persecution. You know, persevered. But not a lot. Not not everyone did. There was a, a community actually called the Qumran community. They were Messianic Jews. They lived near the Dead Sea. And what happened was they were facing so much persecution because of their sect, their specific view of Judaism. You know, this is like the completed Judaism, right? They were facing so much persecution in and out of the community, inside, internally, and outside from everywhere else. They started to start, they, they started to adjust. They're like, okay, maybe, you know, if, we're, if we keep telling everyone Jesus is the Messiah and they're going to hate on us, maybe we should like, tweak that a little bit. And so they got to the point where they're like, okay, let's say, well, Jesus was a great teacher. He was like a holy inspired person. So let's say that he was like an angel. Instead of saying he was God, God himself, God's son, they started to say, okay, well, you know, just to per avoid persecution, they started to, to adopt this theology that he was like an angel. And that's why in Hebrews, the very first chapter talks about angels and what angels are. He's explaining, look, this is what angels are. They're ministering spirits who serve. And then they're powerful, yes, you know, like an army. But they are not the Messiah. He's making, the writer is making very clear to these people because, you know, they went so far to claim that Michael, the archangel, they claimed, you know, well, Michael, the archangel, would be higher in status than the coming Christ when Jesus came back. You know, and this is probably a defense mechanism because they didn't want to get persecuted. But this is what was going on in the, in the Hebrew community. This was a situation in many Jewish circles. And that's why from emphasis, uh, chapter 1, the emphasis is on what is an angel, first of all. And then what is Christ? Christ is superior to the angels. In the Bible, we see that, you know, in the Old Testament, Israel continually had sin. So what they had to do is they had to do these sacrifices, right? This is what, what the Levitical priesthood um, aspect of Hebrews, this is what all the Hebrews understood. We sin, 
we 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 buy our little offering, we sacrifice it, and you know this is how we all get forgiven of our sins. The Jewish people, the Hebrews that they were writing to, knew this. This was the system of sacrifices that was symbolically represented the inner repentance of sinners and God's divine forgiveness. In other words, they continually had to do this because they knew, they admitted that you know what, human beings, yeah, we're not perfect. You know, we mess up. We're not going to pretend to be perfect. You know, you know it's, it's kind of like, it'd be different. Like in, if, if Jesus came to Asia, you know, if Jesus came to China and Korea, Japan, you know, during the Confucian age, you know, people wouldn't be like, yes, I'm a sinner. They'd be like, well, I'm not really that bad of a person. You know, like, you know maybe they'd be like, you know, they, they'd try to, you know, defend or, you know, uh, show their the goodness, the integrity. But <laughs> Jewish people, you know, they're proud. But when it comes to sin, they know who's God. They know, you know what, <laughs> every, every few months when they go to the temple to do the sacrifices, come on, you add up all that money, you know, they could be like, dude, let's think of a better way. But no, they did it for centuries and centuries because they understood that sin was real. That sin was, there, was a problem that they had in their life. God's provision for this okay, was through sacrifice. But because people, and even the priests, they continued to sin. They continue to make they need they continually need sacrifice. The need of mankind was for a perfect priest. This is what the writer is now getting to the point. You he's saying, you all know you're sinners. You all know that you are trying to do well, live life better. But you know what? No one's perfect. We need a perfect priest, perfect sacrifice that would once and for all remove sin. And God's provision for this was the Messiah, was the Christ. This is the central message of Hebrews. We know that Jesus is the Christ, right? Um, I don't know if any of you, before you met Jesus, ever sacrificed a living animal. Probably not, uh, because we're all living in this in, in America. I think that's illegal. I don't know, right? But can you imagine if you're Hebrew, growing up in Israel, and that's culture? Like, every few months, you're killing animals. Man, today, PETA would have a, like, craze fest over there, right? But Jesus was to be that perfect sacrifice. It contrasts the imperfect and incomplete provisions of the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, when Moses made these laws and gave these laws uh, to the people, this was the situation in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, now he's saying Jesus finished it once and for all, complete. The new covenant that we have in Jesus Christ is that we worship a heavenly Savior as citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We are, we are in, the in the book of names in heaven. When we go to heaven, there's a book with our name on it. Pretty darn big book. But John describes it as a book. A book with each and every one of our names on there. We have direct access to God. Whereas before, they needed a priest. They needed somebody to do the sacrifice. Now, the sacrifice did it himself. That's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can now approach the throne of God boldly. You know, um, still even, you know, because I'm Asian, I know like a lot of times, you know, there's this like culture where you can't approach certain people, you know, like, Oh, that person's higher than me, or you know, such a famous person. Like, you're like, you gotta just stay away. You know, like, oh, he has, oh you know, you gotta, you gotta do all this like bowing, and you know, it's kind of rude if you go up to me like, hey, what's up, pastor, whatever. You know, you want to pass song? What's up, pastor? Song? How you doing? You know, and and he, it, it, might, it might, you know, he'd probably be welcoming because he's kind of young. But if you ever been to, you ever seen an old pastor? I never see people come up to old pastors. Everyone's just doing this all the time, like. We, in Christ, when we face our God, we used to be that way. We used to be like, hey, God, you know, oh, did you get my sacrifice? Yeah, those two pigeons? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How about that goat last month? Yeah, yeah, I got you. See you next year, you know. Now, we can go boldly to the throne of God. That's the whole significance of this book. Hebrews was written for the Hebrews, but to you and me, it's reminding us our relationship with God. We have direct access and can approach the throne of God boldly. Our hope is in not 
our sin being forgiven. Okay, that's actually not even that important. For us, now it's not even important. Our hope is the very presence of God. Are you directly connected with God? Are you directly in the line of God's covenant? That, that is our hope. Wherever Savior Christ goes, we are going. You know, like the ultimate plus one. You know what I'm saying? You ever, you know, you ever try to go to like a, a an event, party, somebody's wedding, I don't know, and you try to go and you're like, and, and the invitation says no plus ones. It's like, ugh. These days I see that a lot. But if you had the ultimate plus one, if you, it's like Jesus says, I got a plus one. Who's going to deny Jesus? Nobody's going to deny Jesus. Nobody can. He is above the angels. He is God himself. And he says, you are his plus one. He's got a big old card, you know? Like, I got a plus here, plus one. Our hope is the very presence of God. Originally, the teaching of the tabernacle symbolized that we didn't have access to the presence of God. We were shut out. They had this section in the temple called Holy of Holies. Okay? It's like, imagine... You know, I kind of think of it, this wall right here is like the Holy of Holies or something. You know, like, you can't go in. You could only go in. Actually, like, there's like rules about what you have to do. They had these bells. People would walk in and drop dead. And then if the bells stopped moving, they would pull them out. Because there's no sin that is allowed to be in the Holy of Holies. We had no access to that. But God sent Jesus, and as the perfect sacrifice, allowed us to have full access. Although the topic today is of angels, okay, it's actually about Christ being better than the angels. In chapter 4, uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, you know, to chapter 2, verse 18, this whole section of Hebrews is about how Christ is better than the angels. According to Hebrews, in verse 1, he describes Christ as the prophet meaning the way for us to meet God. In verse 3, he refers to Christ as the priest who did the perfect sacrifice. And actually, in verse 3 and 8, he describes Jesus as victorious, as a king. Those are the three offices, prophet, priest, king. In Israelite culture, that required anointing. And the title of Messiah, Jesus Christ, not his last name, means anointed one. You know, sometimes when I watch like Christian movies or, or not even Christian movies, when I watch regular American cultural, you know, products, TV, movie, whatever, and they talk about Jesus. It's so, it's easy to spot. Just listen. It's like, oh yeah, they really think Jesus, it's like his name is Jesus Christ. They think his name is Christ. That emphasis on Christ, it gets lost very easily. Hebrews was written so that we would not lose that emphasis is on Christ. Is Jesus the prophet, priest, and king for you? If you want to experience God living in your life, you must know this Jesus as the Christ. Not you must know Jesus Christ. Everybody in America knows Jesus Christ. Even Satan knows Jesus Christ. They just don't like him. For us, we can't merely know Jesus Christ. We have to know Jesus as the Christ of our life. Not as an angel or some spiritual entity, just a little better than you and I in between. You know, there's some religions who believe that Jesus was like a super angel, and when we die, we're going to be like Jesus, meaning we're going to be like super angels, just a little bit in between God and man. Yeah. There's a lot of theories about, you know, these angels and its relationship to Jesus. But he's not a great teacher, an enlightened human being who we can strive to, to, to be. Remember those bracelets? What would Jesus do? You know, like, yeah, I'm going to wear this bracelet and I'm going to do what Jesus would do because as if it was something that I could do. They're missing who, they're emphasizing Jesus. They're not emphasizing the Christ. If we understand Jesus is the Christ, he's our Messiah, our anointed Savior, the prophet, priest, and king. The writer of Hebrews um, is writing to actually three types of people, three types of Hebrews. At the time, there are three types of Hebrews. One, the believers. 
Okay? The second group, unbelievers who were intellectually convinced of the gospel. I think that's really interesting. They're unbelievers, but they are intellectually convinced, not skeptical. These are all three types. These are all these three types of Jews were the ones in the church. And finally, unbelievers who were attracted to the gospel and the person of Christ, but who had reached no final conviction about him. Those are the three types of Christians, Jewish Christians, that were in the current age, that age, which is why they wrote why he wrote the book of the letter of Hebrews. I know many of you have heard the good news. Many of you you know, are true disciples, true believers. But if anyone who hears this message has any doubt which of the three types of people they are, let's change that. We can change that. We must change that. In the church, those three types of people today, I think, there are believers. And then there's unbelievers who are intellectually convinced. Unbelievers who are attracted to the gospel and Christ. They're even attracted to Jesus can't reach the final conviction about him. I want you to all close your eyes right now. I want us to pray. Let's pray to God. Let's really ask God for grace, for wisdom, for love. Let's really look into our life, into our heart. Hebrews was written for those three types of people. Where do I stand? It's not a bad thing to be, it's not something that is like a, to, to discourage you, but really, where do I stand? Because I want all of us to experience God living in our life daily. Like the guardian angels that just appear whenever there's things that are going wrong in my life. I know that in the face of darkness, hardship, God is there. God reveals himself. God works through the angels, and those angels are with you every day, every second. If you have any doubt, ask yourself, am I really a believer, or am I just intellectually convinced of the gospel? Am I just attracted to the person of Christ? Let's reach that final conviction that Jesus, you are not Jesus Christ, the name. You are Jesus, who is the Christ, my Messiah. Repeat after me. Uh, say with me. Let's say this prayer together. Dear God, thank you for your wonderful love and plan of salvation in the book of Hebrews. I realize that I am a sinner and I repent. I believe you sacrificed yourself on the cross for me and you are the perfect priest in my life. I believe you are the way to meet God and I open up my heart to accept you as my Lord, my King, and my Savior. I thank you for forgiving me and saving me. Change my life and help me to live Obedient to your will. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.